Hello, everyone. And can you hear me okay? All right. Uh, I'll welcome you to the Freedom and Design Pecha Kucha event. My name is Amber Holland, and I will be hosting tonight. And I'm joined by two dynamic licensed architects whom I will be introducing shortly. Uh, first, I want to mention that this event is a part of a larger Freedom Festival that is comprised of a wide variety of online and hybrid events all over the country. And the festival was organized by Improv Science and Eastside Institute. And I will also share a little about myself and why I wanted to organize an event about design for this festival. Um, I am a design enthusiast and I see this event as an opportunity to explore the relationship between freedom and design in a community setting. And personally, I feel uh, that one of the best ways that we can exercise our freedom as individuals is through design. And that's because design involves making choices. Um, and in turn, collectively, I see design as a tool for liberation. Another reason I'm thrilled to put on this event and be a part of this festival is because I grew up celebrating Juneteenth every year in Anchorage, Alaska. Every summer on Juneteenth in downtown Anchorage, there was a party in the park with delicious soul food, wonderful music and entertainment on a central stage. And there was this joyful energy and lots of color, colorful art and colorful clothing. So in short, it was a good time. And now I live in Massachusetts and I've lived here for many years and there's a lot of events to attend celebrating Juneteenth, which is awesome. Um, and tonight we extend the celebration of freedom that began yesterday on Juneteenth as we approach another freedom holiday, Independence Day. And just to remind everyone, Juneteenth marks the emancipation of the last enslaved African-American people in Texas in 1865, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So as we listen to each speaker, Let's keep the legacy of Juneteenth in our hearts and minds as we creatively explore freedom together. And the speakers will present their work in a loosely Pecha Kucha inspired fashion. For those of you who don't know, Pecha Kucha or Pachakacha means the sound of conversation in Japanese and translates to chit chat in English. Uh, the format was first conceived by Tokyo-based architects, Astrid Klein and Mark Dytham, who were seeking a way to use PowerPoint more effectively. But um, Pe Pecha Kucha presentations are traditionally composed of 20 slides with 20 seconds of commentary per slide. But tonight we are going to not adhere so strictly to the traditional format, but the presentations will be in the spirit of Pecha Kucha. And the first speaker, Ann Sussman, will discuss her eye-tracking research the importance of understanding ourselves and how much of our architecture has been shaped by war trauma. And Anne is an architect, researcher, and author of the book, Cognitive Architecture. Her work bridges architecture and neuroscience, and she is the president of the Human Architecture and Planning Institute, or the happy.org. The second speaker, Aisha Densmore Bay, will discuss the process of creating her award-winning film short room and using art to discuss ethics and architecture. Aisha Densmore Bay is an architect, artist, and filmmaker who has an eponymous Boston-based creative practice that specializes in architecture, interiors, graphic design, film, and art. And throughout the presentations tonight, we encourage you to enter your thoughts and insights into the chat. So now, without further ado, here is Ann Sussman with her presentation entitled, We See the World Like an Animal Because We Are One. Whenever you're ready, Ann. That's a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Ann, and I'm going to talk briefly about how um, new understandings in neuroscience, new tech tools can really help us understand who we are, where we came from. And in a way, this can connect to um, the Juneteenth celebration, um, because understanding, giving us freedom to really look at ourselves in ways that maybe we were taught to ignore in earlier times. So what I'm showing you here is actually the Mona Lisa, the most visited painting in the world, or one of the most visited paintings in the world. And you can now get software that's a plug-in for Photoshop 
to show how people non-consciously immediately look at the paint painting, where they will look first, second, third, and fourth, how they'll really focus on the face. Um, and, and, and it's important to kind of understand um, how we take in our world and how that connects to our history and how it connects to our biology. There's a wonderful quote from a Buddhist teacher, a, a healthy vision of the future is not possible without an accurate knowledge of the past our historical past, um, our biological past as well. Um, and that freedom that we can, um, we can honor today, you know, let's just really acknowledge what we are and how we got here and then also how to build a better future. So going back here um, as an architect, I can now use this tool that was developed by vision scientists at 3M um, to figure out how people actually look at signs. And it turns out it's actually really relevant when, look, when you use it to, um, to how we look at paintings, also how we look at buildings. Um, and that's part of the, the amazing stuff that's available now that wasn't available uh, when I went to, to college or architecture school in the 20th century. We now know, for instance, that the human brain devotes more area to face recognition than to the recognition of any other visual object. Eric Kandel, a, a neuroscientist who won a Nobel Prize, wrote that in the book, The Age of Insight, which was published in 2012. He was fascinated by art. And this is a book that explains how art works, why paintings with faces on them would be the most famous in the world. It's quite interesting. It's an access to understanding that when I went to school in the 20th century, we just simply didn't have. Um, and we, one of the scary things is that I think we need to actually look at during Juneteenth is how big business actually does know some of the science and uses it to promote consumption. Um, and that's kind of amazing. It's not arbitrary that whether you're selling oatmeal or baby food or software, you're going to have a corporate logo that's a face. Big business knows that to get attention, you have to make a logo that represents what people are basically built to see, um, the face. And then this is something else, this is an experiment I did in 2018, where before my talks about neuroscience and architecture, I would ask people in the room, in this case, I gave 19 talks, most of them in the United States over that year, one in Berlin, Germany. And before I talked, I'd say, draw a house as if you're a five-year-old. And um, then on the same card, tell me where you were born and where you grew up. And what was amazing was to watch how people from all over the world drew the same thing most of the time without even looking at what other people were doing. Why? Because the template for the face is already hardwired in our brain. So whether you're from China, Zambia, Serbia, Spain, Italy, Russia, India, Turkey, you're gonna end up when someone says house, you'll end up drawing the same prototype, okay? And that actually is relevant to how we build our world today because you can now understand that um, you can actually use software, which I just showed you in the beginning, first slide, 3M visual attention software, to show how people will take in the world. And what happens is they now know consciousness happens unconsciously first. And that unconscious few seconds directs what you think about consciously. So when you look at the um, carriage house on the left, a 19th century building not far from Harvard Square, that's a school today, it's actually part of a school campus, non-consciously people are going to immediately focus on the eye like windows and the door. Whereas the modern library um, in New York City, this is in Queens, New York, built about 20 years ago, people are more likely to fo focus on the fire hydrant, the edge of the building or the book drop than the, than the library itself. So that's a major question. What happened? that the face-like bias, which we now know biologically is what mammals are hardwired to do. How did that get out of architecture? That's a really, that's a really good question that we're free to ask today. Um, and and it's, it's really important we ask those kind of questions. How did modern architecture happen? Why did buildings become blank and faceless? Like they're not even there, right? And so to ask that question, you have to look at who are the fathers of modern architecture. Um, because I am, I do teach, I ask, haven't asked my students, you know, who are the fathers? They should be able to know these names. Mies van der Rohe, Walter Gropius, Le Corbusier. And what's interesting is they're all born around the same time, you know, a, a decade and a half before the, the 19th century. 
of the 20th century, and they all die about the same time um, in the 1960s. And when they're in their 20s and almost 30, there's like a catastrophic thing happens, the first industrialized warfare in human history. Uh, 20 million deaths, the first bombers, the first assault rifles, the first tanks, who knew? And um, we, and that really kind of changed society, changed our world. Uh, there was recently in 2018, PBS put out a documentary about this called saying the impact of World War I is contemporary. And they wrote that before Putin invaded Ukraine because one of the greatest losers of World War I um, was Russia because Russia lost empire. It collapsed in 1917. Um, and this is a painting by John Singer Sargent. He was hired at 62 to go paint the American and UK soldiers on the Western Front fighting together. Um, but what's really interesting, again, we can ask different questions now, like, well, what happens after you come back from a conflict like World War I or Vietnam for that matter? When we now know we have a term for it, post-traumatic stress disorder, a term that doctors didn't really even start to use till 1980. And now we have technology tools where we can actually look inside the brain and see what happens to soft tissue. This didn't even come online till 1990s, magnetic resonance imaging. And you could see if someone's been through war trauma or other kinds of trauma, the brain actually shrinks and it changes how they will perceive and take in stimuli because the brain has changed, okay? So during a trauma, your brain responds by going into fight or flight mode. And with trauma, your brain can get stuck there. And that's what's quite fascinating. So now when you look at Gropius, who was hired by Harvard in 1930 to teach modern architecture, they hired him not knowing that how the World War I impacted him. They couldn't have known. Um, and this is Gropius's house at the left in Lincoln, Massachusetts, about 10 miles west of the Harvard campus. And um, Harvard wanted him to live in Cambridge. He said, no, 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 no. He chose to live in a remote orchard area. Uh, and what's interesting is the house kind of is a replica of a bunker. The bunker on the right is on the Western front like ones he would have known. And it has the same slit windows, the same flat roof. And so what happens with post-traumatic stress disorder, what people now know is non-consciously your brain makes you recreate the trauma as it attempts to heal from it. Remember, PTSD was not a word, post-traumatic stress disorder was not a word, but doctors even knew about till the 1980s. And it wasn't until the 1990s they could understand how much trauma changes the brain and can stay in the body, okay? So with PTSD, you become disembodied as your buildings. So Gropius's house is on the right, and on the left is the house opposite <laughs> opposite the driveway, a traditional New England house with detail where you immediately know where the front door is. Gropius house is exact opposite experience. Um, and what's fascinating, you walk in and you immediately see the house is now part of, owned by a nonprofit, it's open for tours. And you walk in and you see, oh my gosh, it's the exact same section as a World War I trench. Okay, that's what PTSD does. It makes you recreate the trauma again and again. So in a trench, you could only see outstanding out and Gropius recreated that exact same experience in his study 3,000 miles away, you know, in a remote area of Lincoln, Massachusetts. And then his bedrooms laid out like uh, the way the um, dugouts where men would sleep in the trenches. The men would sleep not in the trench itself, but within the wall um, behind a sturdy doorway. And so he actually did the exact same layout, believe it or not. Um, in his in his house here, he made a corridor and then he made a sturdy doorway and then he put his bed behind it. It's kind of wild. But when you study PTSD, I've showed this to doctors and they say, no, this is exactly what PTSD does. Um, this is the, I presented this at the National Trauma Conference, the 30th Annual International Trauma Conference in Boston run by Bessel van der Kolk, Modern Architecture, Direct Expression of Trauma, World War I Trench. I got no pushback. So basically this 21st century paradigm shift is what psychologists talk about and biologists talk about when they say new understandings and how humans work changes how we see things. So now we have the freedom to, to look at how the, what this does to architecture. These are all buildings in greater Boston. Most of them are protected by historic bylaws. You couldn't change them if you wanted to. And what do they most look like? Faces. We, know, we now know neurologically why that's the case. 
non-consciously, that's what the human brain needs to see to most effectively feel um, in a place and to feel safe, all right? This is a quote from a doctor who actually looks at how trauma impacts childhood development as well as adult longevity. When you know the mechanism, you can use that understanding in countless ways to drastically improve the human condition. That is how you spark a revolution. You shift the frame, change the lens, and all at once the world is revealed. Nothing is the same. That's kind of what's going on now. And we've got the freedom to actually look at this and how it upends previous uh, paradigms. Okay, and so freedom lets us acknowledge who we are and how we function and how to build a better future. Okay, so my name is Ann Sussman, and this is the kind of work we do at the Human Architecture and Planning Institute. Right now, to become a licensed architect in the United States, there is no biology or psychology requirement, and we're trying to change that because architecture is how we create community, and really, you need to make great architecture to improve humanity. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Anne, that was great and very eye-opening. Um, I'd like to take a moment to pause to think about how understanding ourselves and acknowledging our past frees us to design in a way that meets our needs and what that looks like. So feel free to close your eyes if that helps. Um, <laughs> you can share in the chat if you'd like, um, and we'll take a moment. All right, so uh, now we will, uh, next is Aisha Densmore Bay with her presentation, Room, Love, Intimacy, and Ethics. Aisha, whenever you're ready. I'm just gonna ask for a little bit of grace um, from everyone who is watching this. I am getting over not one, but two separate illnesses in the same week. And I also have a, a, a summer allergy. And so if I'm coughing a little bit, please, um, please forgive me. But I am going to uh, share my screen. Okay. Oops. Okay. Hopefully. All right. I'm sure everyone can see, correct? Yes, you can see. I just, okay, perfect. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> okay, so again, um, my name is Aisha Densmore Bay, and I am an architect uh, here in Massachusetts. I'm also a designer, a filmmaker, an artist, blah, blah, blah. And I'm also a doctor of design candidate at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. So I thank everybody for coming uh, to hear these presentations today. Okay, let's see. There we go. Okay. So like Amber said, um, my practice uh, is here in Boston <clears throat> and it's based in architecture, grounded in architecture, but it also um, operates in graphic design and design strategy. Um, there's a teaching element to my practice. I also do um, various forms of art, <laughs> excuse me, uh, writing and children's books. And I'm also, like she said, a filmmaker. And so we're gonna focus on the filmmaking element of my practice today and talk about uh, my film short room that I completed in late 2019. So um, I actually started working on this film right after the Sundance Film Festival in, or, you know, which takes place earlier um, in the year in January to February of 2019. And so it was my first narrative film short. I had done a documentary um, style um, film about architecture as well, but this was my first narrative film short. So I had to kind of learn a lot of things, um, <coughs> excuse me, learn how to write a screenplay, um, how to storyboard, all that kind of thing, things. Um, but uh, the kind of the original premise that I was working with is, is on the center of the page, you'll see what would happen if a frustrated architect were stuck in a hotel room for a weekend and, and came out changed on the other side. And so um, I knew where I wanted to shoot it at the Dean Hotel in Providence, Rhode Island. And I started thinking about um, 
what would be some reasons that the architect would change, you know, over the over the weekend. And so I started thinking about ethics and thinking about are there any um, ethically questionable, what some people may think of as ethically questionable either situations or projects um, that an architect would, um, you know, take on, uh, specifically an African American architect. And so um, one of the things I started thinking about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is prison design. And that was a lot of what was going on, um, kind of like what was in the conversation um, during that time. And a full disclosure, I had actually worked on a prison when I was, you know, earlier, much earlier in my career, in my 20s. And so I was reflecting on that <laughs> and just thinking about also knowing that um, America is a, basically a carceral system and we imprison more of our population than other countries. In fact, most countries, and I think all countries, we're, we're the like number one as far as uh, imprisoning our citizens. And so when I, <coughs> excuse me, um, and when I started <laughs> thinking about it and then looking at some of the numbers um, after, this is obviously after I completed it, but in 2021, um, you know, there were 1.2 million, over 1.2 million uh, people who were incarcerated in the United States. That's federal, state, that's military, all of that. Um, and in 2019, when I completed the film, um, per, per 100,000 people per race, um, if for African Americans, uh, there were, <laughs> excuse me, there were over 1,000, there was 1,096 uh, people per 100,000 people. Um, and then that number increased um, to, you'll see like 11.8% per 100,000 Black people, as opposed to on the right side, the number stated about 2% um, for white Americans. And these are, um, these are numbers from the Bureau of, Just, Bureau of Justice Statistics. So when I started uh, working on the film, you'll see the day is early in 2019. Um, I started writing the script, but then I wanted to make sure um, that there would be an interest. And so I posted it on Facebook, just a simple question uh, to my friends, especially to my architect friends, um, and saying, well, where do, you just, where do you stand on designing prisons? Would you, you know, would you not? Um, are there any, um, kind of qualifying factors where you where you would consider it. <laughs> Excuse me. And you know, obviously I said no judgments on other on either side. And if you want to direct message me um, to talk about it, um, you know, feel free. So I got about 33 comments, which is about average until you hear that it was 33 comments in about an hour that I got. Um, and a lot of people, and these are just the public comments, not even the direct message comments. And so I understood at that time, you know, that the project, that the idea, you know, had feasibility and that it would be something that people would be interested in talking about and, and hearing about. So like I said, um, I started principal shooting um, at the Adine Hotel in Providence, Rhode Island. If anyone is going to Providence or knows Providence, <laughs> I encourage you to stay at this hotel because it's fabulous. I had stayed at that hotel in 2018, about a year before I started filming, a little less than a year before um, I started filming. So luckily the general manager said yes, so we were off to the races. Um, and one of the reasons why I love this hotel is because a lot of the architectural details and the design details helped me tell the story. <laughs> Excuse me, and so a lot of the neon signage that is here that you'll see um, kind of helped help the story along and the architecture of the hotel also helped me um, tell the story. So even some of the signage like on the on the doors and everything else, and you, you'll have to see the film short to, <laughs> to see it and understand everything. Um, but specifically also because a lot of this movie dealt with um, a couple and that's what I should have explained before. So I apologize. The premise of the story is that there is a, um, a couple a uh, man and a woman, the woman is an architect and uh, her boyfriend is an artist. And they go to this hotel for a romantic weekend. It's the architect's birthday. And um, part of the tension um, during that weekend is that um, the architect, her firm has been commissioned to design a prison. And uh, the artist, he has a family member that is in prison. And so 
that spawns a lot of the tension um, that happens in that weekend. But, <laughs> excuse me, there's also a lot of vulnerability um, that happens. And so, like I said, part of the, the, well, the intimacy and the vulnerability and the love that is shown in this movie, um, it, there's also a lot of things of transparency and part of the um, architecture that happens and the design that happens in the hotel is that the, um, if, I look, if you look to the left, the bottom left, um, there are vision panels that are in the showers. And so there's a lot of uh, talking about you know, visibility and there's a lot of mirrors that are in the film short as well. And so it's really about seeing yourself, seeing another person and really opening yourself up and being vulnerable. So uh, we started, yeah, started principal uh, shooting on June 26th of 2019, and we ended on June 28th. We had less than two days to film the short. Um, but we had a wonderful uh, cast. Uh, the husband, uh, on the left-hand side, <clears throat> the characters in the film are Mitchell and Zaina. Zaina is the architect, um, and Mitchell is the artist, and he's actually wearing a t-shirt that I designed. But this is a wonderful husband and wife uh, team uh, that are team of actors, and I was very and they're Shakespeare trained, and I was very lucky to get them to be part of the film. And then on the right hand side um, is Jason Gravasio, who was on the left side of the picture, who played the hotel valet, and Ricky Eric, who played uh, the hotel staff, the front desk. So these are just some images um, from the from the short. Um, they were taken by uh, a Rhode Island creative. His name is Ryan Lopes. Um, but you can see how some of the architectural elements, you know, <laughs> excuse me, are really helping to tell the story. Uh, and also part of the tension in the movie that exists is that as a gift, uh, he gives, Mitchell gives Zaina uh, this book for her birthday. And it's not that he gave her a book for, the for her birthday. That's not the problem. It's that, you know, she feels that there's the subtext um, in this book. And this is a real book um, by uh, an architect, a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. He is wonderful. His name is Melvin Mitchell. And the book, obviously, you can see is called The Crisis of the African American Architect, Conflicting Cultures of Architecture and Black Power. And in the book, there are a lot of examples about um, <laughs> architectural culture, um, and then also um, the buildings that we design, and how they are antithetical to the ideas of Black power and Black liberation exactly like prisons. So what I'd like to do is show you a very brief um, snippet of the film. And let me just kind of tell you what's going on here. So obviously they are in a very tense moment and um, Zaina is arguing that she doesn't like designing, the, she doesn't want to design the prison either. <laughs> but at the same time, she's able to advocate for some change by, by, her, by her being on this project and her office actually taking a more um, sensitive and caring approach and humane approach to prison design. Um, she's feeling like the prison is gonna be designed either way. So wouldn't you rather have someone who is ready to um, design it humanely and, and, and think about the prison, you know, the prisoners and, and talk about rehabilitation. Um, and he is thinking, her, her partner is thinking, you shouldn't be doing this at all. So here's the, here's the, the clip. You can ask to be reassigned. Why didn't you ask to be reassigned? Because I don't want to. Look, if not this, now and not over this. If this won't get you to understand why this is so fu- mm. What? If this won't get me to understand what? This is my job. Yes, it's your job, but you're selling your soul for it right now. I'm not selling my you soul. I'm trying to do something this. good. What good is this? What is good about this? It's good because it might actually help someone on the other side. What no. if it helps reduce recidivism? How many people will it hurt? Thank you so much. So I'm gonna return sharing my screen. Okay. So like I said, um, there's not always this tension that exists, you know, within the um, you know, within the movie. There's also a lot of tenderness, a lot of love, a lot of uh, sensitivity. And again, I will say that these, these two actors came and did not come to play. And they really um, were excellent in how they portrayed these characters with a lot of warmth and um, the, the vulnerability and the love was palpable. You can kind of see it through the screen, so. 
Uh, this is, I like this photo because it shows me doing my directorial thing. Uh, and this is obviously mem two members of my crew. And filmmaking, you know, for someone who hasn't done it before, <laughs> it is really challenging. But this was a very challenging shoot. We had a very good time, but it was a very challenging shoot. And that um, the hotel was uh, at capacity that weekend or during that week anyway, um, because there was a conference happening downtown. And so every room was full. So we had to be very careful um, and being very quiet. We couldn't shoot too late. We couldn't disturb anyone. There were a lot of, um, a lot of constraints that existed. Um, there were people who were constantly trying to get into the shots. It was, it was madness. Um, but then also, you'll see in the background, um, we had to deal with construction site noise. There was a new building being uh, uh, constructed right across the street. So there were a lot of, a lot of challenges, but I'm you know, really pleased with the final product. And so it was also very important to me, um, it, it just worked out that way, but um, it was very important to me to have an African-American cast and crew um, because everyone came to the set after they read the script. Um, they came to the set with an understanding and a real uh, desire to help tell the story because they understood um, <coughs> the challenges of the, you know, what, what prisons have done to African-American communities and families and things like that. And they also wanted to get involved and be part of it as, as an art piece. And so I'm very appreciative to all of, who, all of them who were involved. And the handsome gentleman who is in the center, his, that is Ryan Lopes. So he is the one that is responsible for most of the, uh, the images in this presentation. So thank you, Ryan. And finally, um, you know, the film had a pretty successful uh, film festival run. One of the most, um, or two, shall I say, um, of the film festivals that I was most proud of was part of the Art House Film Festival in Chicago. And then also the um, Roxbury Film Festival, which is actually going on right now uh, here in Boston. And it was really um, a full circle for me, full circle moment for me being part of the festival because when I moved to Boston in 2005, you know, I didn't know anyone. And so I was, <coughs> excuse me, I attended the festival every single year because it grounded me not so much, well, I won't say not only uh, in you know the Boston African American community, but also the cultural community here, the arts, and all of that. And so to be part of the festival, you know, in 2019, it was just this full circle moment that was very humbling, and you know, made me feel like I was home. Uh, and if you want to see the film, it is streaming on a global black um, platform called Quelly TV, um, and the platform is dedicated to not only telling stories from the African-American perspective, but the African-Guyanese um, perspective. And there are, um, there are people from uh, France and from you know, Nigeria and Ghana and all over the world, um, Black people all over the world um, that have stories and you know, films on this platform. And it's really a top-notch uh, platform. So I'm really honored to be a part of it. And if you're interested in hearing more about me, you can go on IshaDB.design or on social on IG, IshaDB Designer. And if you want to see some more behind the scenes um, uh, <coughs> images and discussion about the film on IG, you can go to Room Film Short. You can see what we ate, what we ate on set and what restaurants we went to and everything. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Aisha. That was wonderful. And I encourage everyone to check out Aisha's film room. I've seen it and it's it's really good. It's artfully done. It's it's really nice. And um, now I'd like to pause for a moment to think about what we how what we design reflects our ethics. and also how what we design reflects our, our views on freedom. And if you'd like, you can enter any thoughts into the chat. <clears throat> also close your eyes if that helps.
right. Um, before we bring, oh, I see, the, uh, uh, before I move on, I want to uh, read one of the comments. It says, rooms for self-reflection or choice in ways of living. This comes from Martha McCoy and Raquel Holmes. And what doors do I lock and why? Mm. Interesting. Rooms for self-reflection or choice in ways of living. And what doors do I lock and why? Let's sit with that for a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Martha and Raquel. And before we bring this evening to a close, I'd like to create together with a quick solo improv activity um, that one of the festival organizers helped me to plan. And I think it's fitting since this event is part of a festival organized by Improv Science, an organization which aims to encourage us to play and work together in an equitable way. Uh, so go ahead and make yourself comfortable. And you can, again, close your eyes. That helps me. If it helps you, you're free to do that. Um, and now I invite you to imagine a space that is designed to support our well-being and human rights collectively. What objects or design elements or architectural features do you see in this space? If you feel compelled, go ahead and type some ideas, thoughts, and images into the chat as they come to you. Or if you if, if you need to keep your eyes closed, and I understand that as well. Now let's think about how those objects, design elements, or architectural features make you feel. And finally, let's try to connect how these feelings relate to freedom. All right. I will, I see some wonderful ideas in the chat here. Jacqueline says, light, curves, and space are the elements she imagined. And it makes her feel open and feminine. And it relates to freedom as a room for all. And, and Amanda Wright, says she feels safe, seen, and connected. Nice, yeah. These are wonderful. We all know that being connected is, oh, and here's another one. Martha McCoy and Raquel Holmes say a creative space to play. I think these are all things that we deserve and that we should be trying to incorporate in our designs. Martha McCoy and Raquel Holmes also wrote home. Having a sense of home, having a sense of being connected, I think we all know that that is beneficial for our well-being and every person deserves to have such, you know, such things in there in, in the designs of their lives. Martha McCoy and Raquel Holmes also wrote Comfort. 
Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for this. This this was great. Um, I love those images that I thought of. Um, I thought of greenery and 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 trees, and it made me think of nature. And then I'm a part of nature, which means I don't have to necessarily. Uh, it made me feel think of freedom because I don't necessarily have to maybe abide by some of the ways things are currently done. Um, and so uh, I'd like to continue these conversations inspired by the presentations with all of you. And one way to do that is to attend the festival's closing conversation on July 3rd. The link to the details and registration page for the closing event is in the chat. And so that would be great if you guys show up and you know anything that you've seen here anything that's inspired you we can continue to to explore freedom and design together and finally i'd like to thank everyone who helped make this event possible thank you ann sussman aisha dinsmore bay dr raquel holmes the improv science team Pavan Danai, Valentina Rolano, the wonderful tech team, mom and dad for encouraging me to, to uh, value my heritage and to celebrate Juneteenth. And I wanna thank everyone here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of this with me and have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>